him where he is. Osama bin Laden has got to be defined and killed. Terrorism as an objective, as an attribute. हम बुराई से लड़ना चाहते हैं बुरे आदमी के सामने हम उसके साथ कॉम्प्रोमाइज वी कैन हैव ए नेगोशिएशन और अ डायलॉग विद हम बाई डिफॉल्ट द माइंड सेट हैज बीन दैट दिस इज वट आई वॉज गोइंग टू से दैट द बिगेस्ट डेंजर दैट एनी कंट्रीज सिक्योरिटी या पर्यस कैन हैव इज ए नबुलस आइडियाज एंड इल डिफाइंड ऑब्जेक्टिव यू आर इट वेरी श्योर वट यू वॉन्ट वेर यू वॉन्ट एंड हाउ यू गेट इट एंड द थर्ड साइड ऑफ दैट प्रायर आइड इज द मीन्स रिसोर्सेज एंड द इंस्ट्रूमेंटैलिटीज थ्रू विच यू हैव टू डिफेंड यूर सेल्फ in this comes all your response systems your capabilities your infrastructure your military preparedness your technological advancement etc now i would like to give you a little brief this thing about what is to be protected just to give you an idea how big is that task one is what we call as the physical assets of the state and since state is a part of the nation so they are important for the national security this physical assets include 3.29 million square kilometers of the land of this country 2.3 million square kilometers of exclusive economic zone a 15000 kilometer long border most of it which is a hostile border with every country except bhutan we have got one security problem or the other we have got 7000 kilometers of the coastal land which has now become vulnerable not only to the terrorists and others but the maritime presence of china which is coming in a big way in the indian ocean has been able to establish its military its naval presence in koko island in myanmar in hawan botata in in uh, sri lanka in gwadar in pakistan and now uh, this thing in seychelles Uh, a naval base in Seychelles. It wants a naval dominance in the Indian Ocean because it feels that it can be choked at the Strait of Malacca, and if the access to South China China Sea has got to be uh, has got to be secured for it, if the if the control over South China Sea has got to be uh, made accessible possible for them, then the dominance of Indian Ocean will be absolutely necessary, and that is where now that they are, I will come to the China portion later. but besides that we have got a lot of strategic assets we have defense installations we have got our industries airports outer space cyber space which have become the new objects of this thing then in the physical assets beyond the physical assets comes very important area what we call as the people people is an asset and a liability both when we have to protect for the security agencies it is a, it's a responsibility which has to be protected and we have got 1.2 billion people with different ethnicities languages cultures fault lines of their own historical conflicts between themselves social tensions communal disharmony caste competitiveness all these factors make it a highly important area for protection the enemy uses subversion for just that is when the enemy targets our people and tries to use them for furthering its strategic interests that is subversion i think the first time when pakistan was created and mr qurban ali who was the one of the senior most intelligence officers in the british time in india in the intelligence bureau who became the chief of intelligence in 1953 he he made a, a, a monograph which was their policy doctrine that balkanization of india is a historical inevitability whenever that takes place Muslims will constitute the biggest chunk in which Pakistan will have the greatest interest, and therefore, this constituency has got to be cultivated. And for that, a consistent effort was made by them. I think not very successfully. That they tried to see if they could have their areas of interest in the population, whether it was in Kashmir or whether it was in other parts of India, with and whether it was the northeast, where they tried to subvert the people. the chinese try to serve, to subvert as general shatkar said about this thing in the northeast so the protection of the people and then of course their physical protection and safety and then the third thing that the state has to protect itself its its polity its infrastructure its constitution most of the, you know in the post war period 43 states have undergone failure or degradation out of which 38 were because of the internal security factors and the internal security it was the failure of their internal security mechanism it was not the wars from outside 
whether it was Pakistan which got divided in two or it is Bangla, it was it was USSR that got splintered, or it is East Timur that was created, or it is Nepal which lost its monarchy. It was due to the internal factors where their system of polity or constitutionality became a victim of the internal uh, uh, thing. Now, we face the threats both from inside and outside to all these factors. But in today's world, what has become is that the wars have increasingly become cost ineffective instruments of achieving your policy objectives whether the Americans trying to achieve their policy objectives in Vietnam or in Afghanistan or in Iraq, the powers which were militarily, technologically, economically much inferior to them, the superpowers were not able to have their way out. So increasingly, now we are getting into the fourth generation warfare. Now the warfare has undergone various this thing. We had a first generation warfare after the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. And then we had this thing of the columns, and then we had the blistering during the second uh, th during the second war. And now we are getting into the fourth generation warfare, the warfare that will be fought within the civil society, where the enemy will be camouflaged within the civil society, and that it will be the responsibility of the security apparatus to protect the civil society and at the same time destroy the enemy which is hidden there. And in this type of uh, civil war, that is why the civil society becomes the most important instrument in having this thing. The people who will be able, the regimes that will be able to control and win these wars would be one which have the highest legitimacy and credibility. And the intelligence capabilities to fight the invisible enemies. If the Americans have to fight, they couldn't do in Afghanistan what they wanted to. It is not that they were militarily inferior. It's not that they weren't able to put the money, they were putting 10 billion dollars a year. It's not their, their equipment was inferior. It is because they were not differentiated who is a friend and who is an enemy. So this battle against the invisible enemy is something that becomes unwinnable unless you have got the support of the people. And that is how the cohesion of the civil society becomes extremely important and the adversarial forces will always try to divide the society, fracture the society on whatever possible fault line that can, that can be forces within and that can be forces outside. Something has been said about our external uh, um, uh, threats. Uh, China was referred by uh, John Shagatka, but I will not go into that, but I'll just like to tell you one thing. That is, the strategic differential between China and India is increasing very fast. It is likely to continue at least for next 10 years. And by about 2030, their military will be about $1.3 trillion higher in terms of equipment. They are going with this thing for the reorganization of the PLA and its modernization. They have been able to develop their own capabilities of manufacturing aircraft after the Soviet Union's uh, degradation. They were able to bring all the scientists from there. They were able to have the um, uh, arrangements of shifting the equipment from there and they started manufacturing in a big way, including the reverse engineering. And now they have got their K-17 uh, airplanes that they are making. They are assembling their own aircraft carrier. They have developed the outer space capability by hitting at a satellite, which was their own satellite, but they have demonstrated that they can take on in the outer space. Their naval capability is increasing at a very fast rate. But, and of course, their missiles are one of the, this thing, the DF-21, which they have developed, a DF-21D version, which will be able to take on any of the uh, aircraft carriers if it comes in the South China Sea. And also the, the, um, uh, uh, the missiles that they are, that they're, uh, naval ships will be able to carry would be quite devastating in the Indian Ocean region. Having said all that, China has also got very serious problems to which they are heading. Besides the internal problems that were briefly uh, there too, China's population is now going to become an aging population. 2030 onwards, it will not be able to have a standing army of 2.3 million that it has got presented. It is also that India is not only going to be remain the world's youngest population, but will also be able to spare a huge manpower for its security forces. It is also increasing technologically because most of the technology that China is depending on is a borrowed technology which is getting dated. And since its international acceptance is much low, nobody is going to spare the modern technology to them. Whereas India is today a most acceptable state, its rise is not seen as an aggressive rise or a rise which endangers anybody's uh, or threatens the international global order. Therefore, India is, will be able to induct the new technology which has already started. 
you know, a good number of our new defense public sector units and some of the, the programs that we are having the space and even the, in the missile systems, etc., they are coming up very well. If within the next five to ten years, if we are able to really indigenize our production and go for the technological, greater technological induction in our defense capabilities, we would be able to do much better. In addition, India has got the advantage that its acceptability in the region beyond Pakistan in, uh, in the immediate just thing, in the Southeast Asian region and others, probably is much more higher. But why does China want? What does China want out of India? Does it want to rule India? What does it want? What are its strategic gains against it? What are its strategic objectives against India? It's very important. They want to contain India. They want to contain India that India is not seen as a rival power center within Asia. If it is so, then China will not be able to have its global supremacy. If it has to have a global supremacy, it first will have to establish the regional supremacy. And if India assumes that regional supremacy, in that situation, the clustering, the, there will be a clustering that will come around India and that is what exactly is happening. Whether we see it in the ASEAN countries or the new positions of uh, the quadrilateral that is coming or even in the, um, uh, in the West Asian countries, and of course, the, the West also is very keen that that does not happen, that China is able to have the domination. So India would be able to position itself, it's only how best we will play our cards. We need some Chanakyas to really understand the, the, the fast changing dynamics and while we cannot mortgage our strategic and security interest to the West, at the same time, we can play the advantage of the vacuum that is created by the distrust against Pakistan and, uh, and the image of Pakistan uh, uh, as a failing state for the filling up that space and using it for building our capabilities. I would not like